morning, good morning. Welcome in today. Uh, so glad that you could be here with us uh, to worship. Uh, before we get started, just want to give a shout out. Uh, that selection uh, was Make Room, uh, made popular by Jonathan McReynolds. <clears throat> but those three young men that you see here on your screen are my cousins, uh, Devin, Donovan, and DJ Turner. And so I'm just so proud of them, uh, what great musicians they have become. And I wanted to uh, highlight them today, um, uh, but especially certainly highlighting uh, that room. I mean, that, that song, Make Room. Um, if the lyrics say, I find space in what I treasure, I make time for what I want. I choose my priorities and Jesus, you are my number one. I will make room for you. So God bless you today for joining us. Those of you who are on with us today, God bless you. We thank you for being here. Uh, those of you who are on Zoom, God bless you. I see you out there. Some of you are on the phone. God bless you for being here today. Um, those who are going to be on YouTube uh, later on when we post, uh, God bless you too. And of course, those that are on Facebook, God bless you. Uh, we thank you for being here uh, this day. Lord God, we thank you now for this time and this opportunity to be together with you. God. You are so awesome. So awesome, God. We thank you for this place. We thank you for uh, this opportunity for us to, to be together uh, in this space, this virtual space. We, I know some of us wish, oh God, that we could be uh, in the household of faith, and some of us wish we could be in the sanctuary. But God, as we deal with these unprecedented times, um, continue to give us hope, uh, continue to establish us in joy and faith, continue, oh God, to, to be the lifter of our heads um, as we as we deal with um, these issues that, that are thrown at us in life. And God, one of these days, uh, most certainly, God, when we're able to be back in the house of worship, um, we will have a newfound appreciation uh, for being in the place. We will have a newfound appreciation, oh God, for your grace and your mercy. And we will have a newfound appreciation, oh God, for the favor that you have shown us even through these moments. Um, for God, we know some of us have lost loved ones. We know some of us have have fallen ill. We know some of us have lost jobs. We know some of us maybe even have lost faith. But God, through it all, you've continued to be with us. You continue to lift us up. You continue to uniquely connect us. And so for that, God, we're grateful. For that, we are so thankful. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, who died for us, but we're thankful for your Holy Spirit that brings and gives us comfort uh, in moments just like this. Now, God, we ask that you would give us what we need in this place at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you today. Let's look at our scripture this morning, which will come from Matthew, the 22nd chapter, Matthew 22. Uh, we're looking at the parable of the wedding feast. So you can most certainly listen in if you are, if you are uh, on the phone, if you can view it, you can see the text here, or you can open up your own phone or your own Bible and turn with me to Matthew 22, Matthew 22 as we look at that text together. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatty calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet but they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite the banquet, anyone you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Amen. God bless. Let's look today. Our text or our, our subject rather today will be many are called. 
Many are called, Matthew 22, uh, verses 1 through 14. Many are called, many are called. Um, that particular text lets us know that many are invited. Uh, and some of your texts may actually use the terminology or the word called. Um, and so we want to look at this text. And, and there's a couple of things I want to share before we kind of get into the understanding of the text. Um, just some, some background so we can just get some perspective in case this is your first time um, here in this particular uh, series of texts. Um, for the last for the last three Sundays, we've dealt with these parables. This is the third of which, the third parable that um, Jesus is sharing with the Pharisees or the religious leaders and with the elders of, um, of the community. And the reason why he's sharing these things is because uh, the question the authority of Jesus has been called into question. So you may remember, and you can go back and read, but you may remember that 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 Jesus went into the temple, took over the temple, uh, turned over some tables, got rid of the money changers. And since then, Jesus has now been teaching in the temple. Jesus' teaching gets interrupted by the, at the religious leaders at the time. And they ask Jesus, by what authority are you here? And they really weren't asking about his teaching. They were really asking about him coming in and messing up their money game. And so Jesus now is responding to um, these religious leaders. And he has done so uh, with the parable of the two sons. He's done so with now the the banquet. And so we we have been going through these parables and and trying to figure out what these parables mean and, and, and how they can be kind of attached to um, to daily life. So so just even before, just, just talking about the text, because I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going through the t- traditional understanding of it. As we often do, uh, we're more uh, concerned about application and understanding how this kind of can be used in our current context uh, more than we are about every little detail of the text. But I, I want, want to go ahead and frame up, though, to make sure we understand that in this particular text, um, some of the traditional understandings of what's going on is okay to apply. And, and we're, we're, we're not getting far from that. Uh, the king is usually represented as God. The son of the king, of course, is represented as Jesus. Um, the, it, it, the servants or the slaves, depending on what text you're, you're looking at, the servants, <clears throat> those first group of servants are usually uh, uh, referred to as the prophets. That next set of servants that gets abused and some of even killed is usually referred to um, the next group of messengers uh, who are persecuted for bringing in this new idea, uh, this this reformed idea of Judaism that is led by Jesus Christ. People like John the Baptist, uh, people like Paul himself, you know, uh, people like Peter, um, other other disciples who were persecuted. Um, as this new Jesus movement began. And so uh, that all of that's okay. The, 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 the people who are rejected, uh, who are killed, a lot of people who say are the religious leaders, which really represents Israel. Um, the next group of people who come in, who are the, the, the people who are invited, um, most theologians say is the Gentiles who come in. Uh, and so, you know, all of those things are fine. And so that traditional interpretation of the text is okay, but that's not where we're going to spend the most of our time. We want to really look at, uh, look at application and look at understanding what's really going on. So this text is not meant to be anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. That's one of the things that, that, that people in some Christian worlds have, have drawn out of texts like this, where Jesus is confronting uh, the Jewish rel- religious elites, and somehow that applies to Judaism um, proper, to, to Judaism in general. And that's not the case. We have to remember that Jesus is Jewish. We have to remember that Matthew, the author of this particular text, is Jewish, and Matthew's audience is primarily Jewish. And so we're not really talking about uh, Judaism versus non Judaism, or even Judaism versus Christianity which at the time of this text didn't really technically exist. What we're really talking about is this idea of of an established religious uh, 
understanding that's now being challenged or reformed or revised by Jesus being sent by God. God is saying, I'm looking at what you all are doing. I'm not completely unhappy with what's going on, but I'm pretty upset about it. So I need to send something else. I need to send some prophets. I need to send John the Baptist. I need to send Jesus. And I need to try to get you to understand that some of the things you guys are doing and focusing on and concentrating on, some of the things that you deem important are not so important. And so um, that's kind of where we are. So I want I wanted to make sure we kind of, 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 of have an idea of where we're going. Uh, this, this beautiful picture that you see before you um, that's on the screen, many are called, uh, has a, a, a variety of, of faces on it from all kinds of different nationalities and all kinds of different ethnic groups, all kinds of parts of the world. And, and this is really what I envision God saying uh, in that text. And we're gonna get to it where it really talks about many are invited, but few are chosen. Um, but I wanna focus in on the front end of that, which is many are called, many are called, many are called. Not just a select group, not just a select group that looks a certain way or has a certain amount of stuff or even lives in a particular country. Uh, it's just not what God is saying. Um, it doesn't matter how many ways we slice it up. It's not what God is saying. Uh, many are called, many are called. The first thing that I want to share with you, our preoccupation with daily life keeps us from accepting God's invitation. Our preoccupation with daily life keeps us from accepting God's invitation. What, what are you saying, Pastor? Look, look, look at this text. And we, we, we see that, uh, that the king sent some servants to tell those who've been invited that I prepared dinner. Um, and, and he invited them to the banquet, tell them to come, and says, but they refused to come. Then, then the king, or, or if, like we mentioned earlier, or God in this particular, is, is, is more than gracious and extends a second invitation. And the second invitation has more detail. Um, so the first invitation was the invitation to the wedding. We just told you it was a save the date, right? It was a save the date. We just told you when it was, told you where it was going to be. Now I'm sending that second invitation. I may have put in the program. I might have said who the band's going to be. I might have said we're going to be serving lobster and shrimp, right? Uh, you know, so so the second invitation has a little bit more meat to it. And, and, and this is what happens. Then he sent some service and said, tell those who have been invited, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. And then verse five, but they paid no attention and went off one to his field and another to his business. And so um, our preoccupation with daily life is what keeps us from accepting God's invitation. What happens is, is that God makes the first step. God shows the initiative and invites the people to this banquet. The banquet is said to uh, traditionally be uh, to, to represent the, the messianic uh, uh, un, uh, unification of, of, of the world with Jesus Christ as Savior. So, so the, the, the banquet is meant to be this celebration, right, of the bridegroom and the bride, of, of, of Jesus uh, giving himself wholly and, and becoming bonded with the world. Uh, which is us, God's people. So this is a big deal. It's a big deal to the king in this particular in, in this particular case to God. And so then, when God has extended the invitation and people decide not to come, it's important that we understand why that happens. It's important that we understand because many of us are even thinking in our in our current context of, well, I know that there's salvation in Jesus. I know that Jesus died for my sins. Why aren't churches full, right? Why are people coming and giving themselves to God, giving themselves to Christ? Why aren't people um, um, behaving uh, in, in, a more, in a better moral way? Uh, why aren't people coming when the, when the pastor opens the door of the church? Why aren't people coming down the aisle? Why aren't people just even just coming to church? Why are people tuning in online? So, so that question may be in our mind, why are people getting this invitation, but they are not answering the invitation? Well, I, I, would, say, I would say it really has to do with this. We want to be invited to things, but we don't want to stop what we're doing in order to participate. We want to be invited. We don't want to be left out. 
but we don't want to stop what we're doing in order to participate. Look at, look at the text now. I, I need you to understand something. Because a lot of times we have this idea that we think that people who are not at church or who don't, uh, don't um, uh, put God first, that, that somehow they are some evil people, right? That they are some, some, some devilish Satan worshiping people and, and, and you know, they all are, are drug addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes and, and you know, they, they, they all are, are doing all these, all these outlandish things. In this text, in this invitation, the reasons, the three reasons that I see, one, one, one didn't, they just refused to come. They just didn't come. Then the other two, it says that one went to the field and the other went to his business. This is what this is what I I, I would like to interject. Um, our daily life becomes such an important part of of our uh, of our makeup that we tend to exclude God from what's going on. We got to raise the kids. We got to go to work. I got to cut the grass. I got to wash the dishes. I gotta I gotta I gotta go here. I gotta go on vacation. I got to do this. I got to do that. And it becomes then it becomes overwhelming to think of God as being a part of all of those things. So when we're when we're when we're rejecting the invitation that's coming from God to come to the banquet, it's not simply that we don't believe. It's not simply that we don't appreciate it. We are just so uh, consumed with the things of this world, with the things that we have created, that we've carved out in our lives, that we are no longer paying attention to when God is trying to come in and tweak some things. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a term that, that some of you can look up, it's called the household codes. And, and Paul's writings in the letters, a lot of times were challenging these particular codes. And part of those codes were just simply the way of life in the Roman empire. And, 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 and part of those codes had to do with um, a man being in charge. So it was really patriarchal, a man being in charge, not only of, of, of his wife and his children, but the entire family, even to the, to the point of sometimes um, the grandfather or the godfather, rather, being um, over whole groups of people, right? So the idea even of the godfather comes from this patriarchal um, household code that comes out of, out of Roman uh, culture, right? And so, so the, these household codes dictated to people how they functioned in society. And, 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 and it, was, it was directly uh, linked to how people did everything that they did, who you were aligned with, how you grew up, whether or not you could ascend to, to some type of royalty, you know, all these things were already laid out by culture and by society. And what happens when that happens is that people then become so ingrained in keeping that society because, because this is what happens. The top always tries to make sure that they stay there and everyone underneath wants to move up one step. And it becomes a way of life. It becomes a way of life. And so I can't reject the whole system because if I reject the system, I don't know where that's going to leave me. If I'm at the top, it may leave me without. If I'm, at, if I'm at the bottom, it may leave me without hope and something to do for tomorrow. I know that might sound, sound kind of far-fetched, but think about that. Think about how we lived out, live our lives. Think about what it is we do. Think about what motivates us. Think about even the, the, the things that are placed in front of you as success in this country. Um, it, it, it might be, it might be to, to be the top of your class. Or it might be to 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 make sure that you uh, have a wife and 2.5 kids with a with a uh, with a with a, a house with a fence around it. It might be now in our current context. It used to be to have a car. Now it might be to have a car for everybody in the house. And, and you know, it used to be um, I just want to have a good job and, and just be able to retire. Now it's got to have I got to have the biggest 401k I can have. And so constantly we're in this this cycle that says, I got to step up my game every day. I got to get the promotion. I got to be in line for, to, to be recognized. And that becomes a way of life. So then when God comes in and says things like back in the, uh, back when we talked about the parable of the, when the, when the workers, when God comes in and gives everybody uh, the same amount of money, no matter how long they worked, 
That blows our mind. That blows our mind. When God comes and gives his son, not just for the folks who come to church, but for anybody that wants access to him, that blows our mind because that doesn't go at all with what we do from a, on a day-to-day -day basis. So why, why, do we, why do we reject? Why do we reject the invitation from God? Just like the room says, I got to make room for you. My life is too, is too convoluted. I, I got too much going on. That, that there's not room and see this goes back to the basic concept of where we separate God from what we're doing in life there was a time there was a period of time where we saw God in everything where we saw God we looked around at the animals and we saw God is in that because God created it we looked around at the trees we looked around at the flowers we say God is in that we looked around at each other and we saw God's image in each other that's not where we are. That's not where the people were that was in this text. And that's, and that's unfortunately not where we are even as a society today. So our preoccupation with daily life is what keeps us from accepting God's invitation. We are simply too busy for our own good, doing all the things that we think are more important that we tag God on to the end. Let's look at our next point. Some will see kingdom building as a threat to their existence. Some will see kingdom building as a threat to their existence. Let's look at this. Let, 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 you can't think of it logically because it's so outlandish that it doesn't make sense. But then when you start tied it into real life and you start really seeing evidence of these things happening in real life, then it really kind of throws you for a loop. It, it does me, it, it throws you for a loop. So let's look, let's look at this because when I first read it, it's outlandish. When I started to think about it, started to really think about what's going on in the world today, it's not that outlandish. But they paid no attention and went off into the field of others to business. The rest, verse six, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Think about now who these servants are. Who, what are the servants doing? The servants are simply delivering an invitation. The second invitation I would add are delivering an invitation of a party that the king is having and all you got to do is come and have a good time i'm not charging you for it there's no cover charge for it i'm not charging you on the way in i'm not charging you on the way out i'm giving you an invite to this banquet to celebrate jesus and to celebrate the union between jesus and god's people and you reject it outright not only do you reject it but now you have seized the messengers you have mistreated them and in some cases you have killed them why would somebody do that is that even real do people even do that we talked about that last time we talked about martin and malcolm and we talked about uh the fact that their message was not popular and how the people who are in power tend to tend to have a threat when you're trying to reform their society. When you're trying to change these household codes that I was talking about, you're going to run into some opposition, right? You're gonna run into some opposition. Um, worldly kingdom, worldly kingdom is based on power, on position and on profit. That's, that sums it up. Those three words can sum up the worldly kingdom that we live in. So this, 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 this reform kingdom or this, this this new kingdom that, that Jesus is trying to usher in is a direct threat to people's power, to people's position, and to people's property. Quite simply, we don't want to be ruled. We want to rule. We don't want to be ruled. We want to be in charge. And you can see that throughout uh, existence. You can see that throughout. You can see that in government. Um, the way government has has has, has grown bigger or, or or lower, and I'm not I'm not talking about from a liberal or conservative uh, American politics. I'm talking about from when you look at the dictators of the world and how they just wanted more. When you look at the Greeks and when Alexander was was running the Greeks, Alexander the Great, and 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 it wasn't enough for him to just conquer Greece; that he wanted to conquer everywhere. When you look at Rome and how they wanted to, it wasn't enough just to conquer Italy. They want to conquer everywhere. When you look at people like uh, Great Britain, 
Um, they didn't want this. They, they were on the island. They had control of their own island. But they said, no, that's not enough. We finna go over here to Europe. We're going to conquer them. We're going to go to Africa. We're going to conquer them. And eventually they came all the way over here um, as 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 Christopher Columbus, who wasn't who wasn't English, but but uh, as Chris, as we just about to celebrate tomorrow uh, Columbus Day, uh, and they found America, right? They came over here and and discovered uh, the New World, and so uh, so here so here we are. It's 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 a similar situation where power, profit, and position. When those things are challenged, then we tend to lash out. Human response to nonconformity is often violent. Human response to nonconformity is often valid. When you don't do what I want you to do, if you are not who I want you to be, if you don't act the way I need you to act, something within me becomes so enraged that I simply, if, if, if I, I don't, instead of coexisting with you, I want to take you out. That, that's what happened in this text. I, I invited you to come and eat with me, to dine with me. You were too busy for me. But not only did you not want to come eat and dine with me, you were threatened by this new idea of kingdom that you decided to kill my messengers. You decided to kill my prophets. You decided to kill the people who I've sent with the new message. You decided to kill people like Peter, like Paul. You decided to kill people like Jesus, like Malcolm, like Martin. You decided to kill these people rather than listen to what they have to say and to say, let me sit back and see if I'm, if there's something that I need to get out of this, if there's something I need to do better. But hold up, you about to take away my power. You about to take away my position and you are you about to mess with my profit. So some will see kingdom building. Some will see this reformation. Some will see this, this new idea, not even new idea. It's the original idea of how God intended things. But some will see this as a threat to their existence and their response will be violence. When core beliefs are challenged, people become violent. When core beliefs are challenged, people become, become violent. Think about it. Think about the, the, the you can go back and, and look and, and, and do some more research, but I'm just going to tell you some things in general that have happened throughout history. That This is not one isolated event. This is not the exception. It is the rule. The Christianizing of Europe. Once Constantine decided that that Christianity was that he could use Christianity. Constantine was the was the emperor of, of, of Rome, uh, of the Roman Empire. Uh, once Constantine decided that he could use Christianity to expand his territory, he decided that everybody who's under me must be Christian. And most of those people were not Christian by the grace of God. Most of those people did not become Christian because somebody delivered the gospel and the good news to them and they said yes. Most of those people were Christianized because they were at the point or the tip of a sword. So Europe, which is Again, this is why you have to. This is why you have to really dig into your history. Europe, which is really non-existent in terms of 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 being relative in the in the biblical history. In biblical history, Europe really didn't have one thing to say or not. They were really, like I said, irrelevant. Constantine goes and decides to expand his territory, so he goes into places that become. That, that eventually become European countries. And he goes into places, especially people, you know, that Norway and Finland and, 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 and places like that were full of Vikings. They believed in, 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 in Viking gods. People in Ireland believed in, in Irish gods. People in England believed in, 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 in English gods. They had a whole different belief system that had nothing to do with Christianity. And, 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 and the Roman Empire goes into these European countries and at the tip of the sword tells all these people, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about if, if, a, whole, if a whole geographic area of people have come to know Jesus Christ by violence, what then will they do when they start sending the word of God in other places? If that's how they learned it, are we really confused about? Are we really surprised that they learned their lessons too well and now they are doing the same thing or have done the same thing? Think about that. So then that becomes the Crusades, right? 
And I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not giving you every detail of history. We don't have time for that. But then that becomes the, the Crusades. Now the Western countries, the European countries are saying, look at those folks down in Africa. Look at them folks, look at the Muslims. We got to stop them. Again, nonconformity is, it becomes challenged with violence. That's our human response to nonconformity. If you are not like me, then I will challenge what you're doing. And if I need to, I will challenge it with violence. So that's what the Crusades were about. There were several different Crusades where the, the kings of England and France sent, uh, sent these, these soldiers, these warriors of God, right, down to, 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 to kill the heathens and retake Jerusalem. Again, violent reaction. You look at this text and you say, that's crazy that they would have killed the messengers like that. And all they were doing is coming there inviting them to the table to be with God. We got history of doing it. We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. And then colonization, the other parts of uh, uh, the later on after the crusades, then the colonization. Again, soldiers are sent into these countries in Africa, in Asia, uh, in Australia, in South America. Co soldiers are sent to these places, not just missionaries, but soldiers missionaries backed up by soldiers. So I want you to believe, but if you don't believe, I'm gonna make sure you believe. If you, and then if you don't believe, then we'll just take you out. Violent reaction based in religion. Violent reactions based in religion. We get, we, we go, we're coming on up, we're coming on up, we're coming on up. And then you think about places like, uh, you think about Gandhi. Many, many of us have heard of Mahatma Gandhi. And we know that Martin Luther King got a lot of, of, of his nonviolent uh, protesting from Gandhi. And so even in parts of India, Gandhi is facing and is fighting for um, the poor. It's fighting for the oppressed. It's fighting against the people who are in power, who are taking advantage of and disregarding the people who are less than. And so then that's why these nonviolent protests started. And then it continues on and it becomes more religious because then that becomes different religious factions in India are now fighting against each other. And Gandhi is trying to create peace in that situation. Come on up, come on up a little bit further. Come on up. I remember when I was, um, when I was uh, probably a teenager, I, I, I should have wrote down the year, but I didn't, but you can go back and look at it. Even in China, as China became, um, um, as China became more and more uh, leaning towards communism, a lot of the, 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 the younger generation decided they wanted to be more democratic. So the people started, they started protesting, right? Which is something that used to be, I say used to be because apparently you can't peacefully protest in America no more without being labeled a thug or, 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 or called out of your name. So I say used to be, but anyway, I digress. Um, the, the, the protesters in, in China then were met with military force. You remember, it was at a place called Tiananmen Square. And all these young people, many of them were killed. We don't even know the official number. Many of them were killed by the military for standing up. Again, violence that comes out of a threat to, to this new idea of kingdom. Violence even in the name of religion. I want to. I, I want to make sure you, you know I'm not making this up. Then we come on up a little bit further to the to the, uh, the indigenous people of the Americas, right? The Indians, who had their own belief system, which focused on still God, right? But they had different things, different ways of understanding who God was, and that didn't fit into the mold of how these people who came over and took their land, and so they made sure that either you believe the way I believe or we'll get rid of you. You work with us, we'll give you some alcohol, we'll give you some drugs, we'll give you some, some, some stuff and, and call it real shiny. That sound familiar, people of color? That sound familiar in our communities? That, this, this, this ain't nothing new. We'll distract you, we'll make you fight against each other indigenous people of America. And then we come on up a little bit further and dealing with slavery. Again, we see where religion is being used to dominate. Religion is being used 
to 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 keep people in a certain role that there were texts that, that that the whole that many of the slave masters pulled exodus out of the bible because they didn't want the the slaves to see that god was a deliverer of the oppressed Some will see kingdom building as a threat to their existence and their reaction will be violence. And then we move on up to the civil rights movement. But we see images where images are burned into our brains of, 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 of children and women and men being, being fire hosed and dogs being sicked on them and billy clubs by police. who usually were in church on Sunday. Being sent out by politicians who usually were in church on Sunday. Being cussed out on the side of the road by Confederate flag toting folks who usually were in church on Sunday. Some will see kingdom building as a threat to their existence. And when their existence is threatened, they will act out in violence. And so we fast forward on up into days and we wonder why now we have these fringe ideas. We have these white nationalist groups. We have these religious uh, set groups. We have these, we have the governor of, of Michigan uh, with a group that's, that's threatening, that had plotted to kidnap her. And we wonder, and we, and we look surprised at how could people be that way? How could people be like that? Some will see kingdom building as a threat to their existence and they will lash out and they will lash out with violence. But look, but, but look at the text. I want you to understand something. I need you to understand this. And then we're going to move to the last point. Then, then it says, then he said to the servants, um, that, no, 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 but verse, verse seven, the king was enraged. Understand it, that, that it may seem like it's going on. It might seem like it's unchecked. But when we go out back through history, and I don't have time to go back through all those examples that I gave you, but every example that I gave you met its end. Every example I gave you met its end. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Now, this was in reference to, Matthew was probably writing this in reference to Jerusalem being uh, being overtaken and destroyed by the Roman Empire around AD 70. That's probably what Matthew was specifically dealing with. Dealing with this, again, um, this, this new idea of uh, that just not even Christianity yet, but this new Jesus movement, this new reformation of, the, of, of, of Judaism. And, and now uh, they are on the losing end. Uh, they've revolted uh, in Israel and, and, and the Roman Empire has stamped them out and burned Jerusalem. And now they're scattered. And now they're trying to figure out how to recover. And they're trying to figure out how to spread this new gospel. And they're being persecuted. And they're being, their heads are being cut off. And they're being stoned to death. And they're being imprisoned. And they're being beaten, right? And that's the atmosphere that Matthew is writing this particular text in. But notice, and I need you to understand, that this opposition that happens where God's servants, God's people are mistreated, that God will and has step in and make a correction. God has and God will step in and make a correction. He's done it all throughout history. And I, I, I'm, I'm just foolish enough to believe that he'll do it again. The last point. Showing up to the party is not enough. Just showing up to the party is not enough. Let's, let's look at the text real quick and we're going to get ready to close this thing out. But verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed the man that was there not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. Showing up to the party is not enough. Chosen has more to do with 
how we respond to the invitation more than it does the invitation itself. What do you mean, Pastor? This is what I mean. So, so, so after after this this the, the debauchery up here that where the, the the people of God really just reject God's invitation. God says, or the king in this case, which we which we understand to be God in the parable, um, says, okay, I those people weren't worthy of of being here anyway. Let's go out and invite everybody, good folks and bad folks. Let's go out and invite everybody and let's fill up this 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 banquet room and let's 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 have the let's have the party that we intended to have to celebrate my son and his union with now all of God's people. So as a result of this invitation, people come. And apparently the place is full. But then God starts to inspect. So so one one of the things that one, one of the things I need you to understand about showing up to the party is not enough is that is that one thing is that you just can't simply be there. You just can't simply be in the place. You can't simply just be in the place. Showing up to the party is not enough. God has a way of figuring out who is there and for the right reason and who is not. What are you saying, Pastor? Let's look at this for a second. It's not enough just for you just to come to church. It's not enough just for you to, to log in. On, on Facebook or YouTube. It's not enough for you to log in on Zoom. It's not enough for you just to, to just to show up. Showing up is not enough. This dude showed up. He was in the place. He answered the invitation. But apparently there was something that was not quite right about him. The reason why he got called out by the king. Showing up is not enough. And what we have to understand is that God is the one. God is the one, not us. Not us. Nobody in the room called out him for being dressed wrongly. I don't even think it was about his dress. That's that's what the parable is about. So it's not even about what you wear. That's that's why we have to be careful how we how we exegete um, a text because somebody will look at this and say, "Well, well, this this is about how we dress." No, <laughs> no, that's not. This was the example that was being used, but it could be applied in a whole lot of areas, and I think that's what God gives us some leeway to try to figure this thing out. But notice who calls him out, not the people, not the people who came with him, not the servants, not the leaders. The person who does the judging is God. And if we will get that one basic understanding as people of God, I'm not even talking about our church in particular. As people of God, as the creation of God, if we would get that one thing in our minds, it would change a whole lot of stuff. Understanding that the invitation, first of all, does not come from you. And secondly, if I'm not invited by you, you can't call me out for being there. Only God can do that. And for whatever reason, whatever was wrong with this dude, it talks about his role. But for whatever reason, how do we apply that? Some theologians say it's talking about righteousness. Some theologians say it's talking about accepting Jesus Christ. Some theologians say that this refers to Judas, um, who comes up and who is the, 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 the traitor in the midst of Jesus. You know, th so there's a whole lot of different interpretations of what this one person represents. Some people I've seen say it represents the devil trying to be in the room, right? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what your interpretation is. It, what matters is how we apply it and how broadly we try to make sure that it applies to make sure that we're covering all of those areas and that we understand that it's not enough for us just to be there. It's not enough for us just to answer the invitation. It's not enough just to show up. But what happens when we show up? What's our attitude when we show up? What's our motive when we show up? Why are we there? Am I there to stir up some stuff? Am I there to get in the way of, of progress? Am I there to see how much stuff I can take, steal, kill, and destroy? Showing up is not enough. You don't get an A just for showing up. You got to do the work. This is not exclusively. And I, I love this because, because some people interpret this and say, well, I think I know that person must have been bad. No, God invited. And I love that, it, that, the, that the text put it in here. It said, so the service went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. God is not trying to, to separate 
what we think good people and bad people are. That's going to be done at judgment. Everybody has the opportunity. Everybody has the chance. No matter what your background is, no matter what you've done, no matter who you used to be, the beautiful thing about God is that everybody has the same invitation. The question is, what will you do with it? So this, this idea of, of, of many being called but few chosen, it's not about uh, predetermination, right? It's not about that. It's not about uh, God already deciding who's going to make it into heaven. That is not what it's about. The reason why it says many, many are called but few are chosen is because many of us will not make the right response. Many of us will not show up for the invitation, as the text already said. Some of us won't come and nobody will know why. Some of us won't come because we're because we're distracted with our daily life. Some of us won't come because we're too busy trying to trying to trying to fight against the church, fight against this change, fight against what God is doing, fight against what's right. And then there are still some of us who are going to show up and going to be in the place thinking that just because we showed up, we ought to get a piece of the pie. And God is saying to us, it's going to be plenty of folks that say, Lord, Lord. And I'm going to be like, I ain't know you. This parable does not speak about, especially the last part, um, does not speak about exclusivity. I want you to understand that this is not about an elite group of people who will make it into the kingdom. This really speaks to our responsibility to act on the invitation. That salvation should propel us into want to do what God needs us to do, whatever that looks like. That God wants us to propel us into service. That God wants to propel us in the works that need to be done. That God wants to propel us into living a life that where we can be the example that will lead other people to Christ. Our salvation should propel us into those things. There's an old song that, that folks used to say, may the works I've done speak for me. My works don't get me salvation. But if I'm going to be saved, if I'm going to get the invitation and I'm, and I'm going to accept the invitation and I'm going to go so far as to show up to the banquet, then surely I should say I'm willing to do the work. What do y'all need me to do? My heart says yes. My body says yes. My soul says yes. I'm not like the two sons. I'm not saying yes and then don't show up. Many are called. I want to leave it right there. I don't want to change the text. I don't want to manipulate the check, text, but I want, I want us to key in on our job. Our job is many are invited. Many are called. Our job is, our job rides right in there. Our job doesn't, doesn't ride on the chosen. Our job does, does, doesn't ride on, on who makes it in. That's not up to us. We're not asked to handle that responsibility. You know what we are asked to do, people of God? To show up, to accept the invite, to do the work, to care, to love, to spread joy, to spread hope, to be peaceful, to not use religion as, 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 a, as a battering ram, as a hammer, to hit somebody else over the head because we don't like them. Because they said something that 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 was that was in disagreement with me, or because they're a different shade of color than me, or because they come from a different part of the world than me, or because they have a different financial background than me, or because because they happen to be a man or a woman, or because they happen to be young or old, all of those things that we use because they happen to be Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or Kojic. where we as the people of God need to live is right in many are called. And what that looks like, that looks like God providing a plan for all of his people. Not just America, not just Jews, not just, not just people who, 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 who say they love Jesus. It's not enough just to say it. Jesus, Judas loved Jesus. I know I, Judas loved Jesus. 
but he loved 30 pieces of silver more. Many are called, many are called. And all of us have the potential to be chosen. God bless you and keep you today.